Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today evening. And I'll speak today on the topic of is the spiritual world just a religious mythology? So I'll speak on this using an acronym spirit where I'll talk about several ways of inferring about the existence of some other world. So I was just about a couple of months ago I was in Silicon I was in Silicon Valley. I was speaking at Stanford University and there after that uh, uh, professor of religious studies he was talking and he said that this idea that there is some other world beyond this world this is simply a religious conception meant to keep people docile okay now that is of course Karl Marx well known idea that religion is the opium of the masses so he said that so I said okay it could be like that also say but I said that if you consider that way it is not just religion which keeps people docile you see mass entertainment is doing the same thing today isn't it people are fed with so much mass entertainment that people just stop thinking and it's that means there is uh, there could be an effect of something but we can't judge the validity of a thing only by its effect we have to look at the content of the belief or content of the idea so I'll talk about this now what do we exactly mean by the spiritual world first of all that is the idea that there are two levels of reality broadly that this is the world we live in is the material world and beyond this, there is another level of reality, which is called the spiritual reality. And the Bhagavad Gita Krishna talks about this at several places, most clearly in 8.20, where he says, Parastasma tu bhavo nyo vyakto vyaktat sanatanaha yahasa sarve shubhute shu nashatsu navinashati. He says, Parastasma tu. There's another world, bhavo nyo. It is of another nature. Vyakto Vyakta Sanatanaha. It is Sanatan, it is eternal. And we emphasize that point, Krishna says again, Yahasa Sarveshu Bhuteshu. When all in this world is destroyed, Nashatsu Navinashati, that part remains as it is. So we could look at this from a different perspectives. So, first perspective is that, as I said, I'll talk about this acronym spirit. S is spiritual longing. Now, what do we mean by spiritual longing? Again, the Bhagavad Gita uses the word spirit in a specific sense. Sometimes the word used spirit is used in a sense of essence of something. Like say, if in a cricket match, somebody doesn't, uh, somebody plays in a very aggressive way, somebody cheats, somebody sledges too much, then they say this is going against the spirit of cricket. So there we use the word spirit to remain the essential activating mood, something like that. So spirit is used in that sense, but the Bhagavad Gita uses spirit in another more specific sense that spirit is a level of reality. And spiritual longing refers to a longing for that spiritual level of reality. Now what does this mean? Spiritual is differentiated from the material primarily based on the longevity. Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha ubhayo rapi drishtontas to anayos tattva darshibhi. Krishna says that of the eternal there is no cessation and of the temporal there is no endurance. So the eternal is spiritual and the material is temporary. So that by spiritual longing we simply mean a longing for the eternal. Everyone, everywhere, all living beings strive very strongly to live forever. If we consider the world around us, nothing in the world lasts forever. Even the giant rocky mountains or Himalayan mountains or whichever mountains we may consider, even they don't last forever. Now with the specter of 
climate change threatening the world there are giant glaciers and icebergs which have been there for a long time and it's just dissolving away so things which we consider as lasting forever they can just decide disappear in one moment so basically nothing absolutely nothing lasts forever and yet every one of us has a desire to live forever so where does this desire come from if a child in say a remote uh, native american reservation where there is no internet there is no there are no phones there is no connection to the outer world bigger world that child suddenly goes and tells his mother mom i want a baklava now the first thing the mother will ask is what do you think she will ask what is it yeah what is a baklava or even if she knows about it yeah how did you come to know exactly so if there's nothing in the envira environment of the child that gives the child any idea of that kind of thing so naturally then the question will come where does it come from so similarly nothing around us lasts forever and yet we all have a desire to live forever our body doesn't last forever the things outside don't last forever so where does the desire come from you know that example they say after this program when the devotees are say winding up and cleaning up they suddenly see a gold ring over here they say oh, where did this come from you know there's nothing directly golden the floor is not golden the wall wall is not golden so where did it come from isn't it so if something is not there in its surroundings then we naturally get the question where did this come from so just as we understand okay somebody must be having a gold ornament or there must be some gold treasure somewhere from where it came out so similarly if we consider that nothing in the world is eternal and yet we have a desire deep rooted desire to live forever so this suggests that this desire comes from some other level of reality so the gold comes from some other place similarly this longing for eternal life points to a arena where there is eternal life now none of these are full proof arguments they are reasonable inferences now, the word proof itself is used in different senses so if i say right now that the time in la is 425 so that you can check it you know you can check on your google you give if you have some time app you can check you can call somebody and check over there so if we give some objective figure some objective fact it can be checked but if somebody asks you what is the proof that your mother loves you well i said she has been taking care of you since my childhood this 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 but you cannot we can not reduce it to one particular proof so proof there are different ways of proving different things so we cannot have quantifiable scientific proofs in the sense of quantifiable verifiable way in science itself there are different ways of proving in fact is a whole different subject but i'll mention briefly here that there is no scientific proof that you exist scientific proof exists because you exist <laughs> what do i mean there is no scientific proof that you exist science can scan the whole body and see okay this is your lungs this is your heart this is your medulla oblongata this is your uh, pituitary gland all those things can find out but where are you the center of awareness obviously if you are not there you would not be asking this question so you are there but that you cannot be found by science there's no scientific proof it's it's a foundation so scientific proof exists because you exist if there had been no conscious observer there would be no consciousness there would be no observation and there would be no science so there are certain things which are bedrock truths 
so the point i'm making is that there are different ways of proving different things so he, so the spiritual world we can infer about it from certain angles of analysis so s is s is the the spiritual longing that is there within all of us now p is paranormal phenomena paranormal phenomena is a scientific term that is used for many phenomena that are not explainable by the current scientific world view there are there are many in this there is telepathy where people can communicate certain messages to others and there is a, um, there's a whole universe out there which science doesn't know about there is a, a well known paper written by a um, researcher in spirituality and health and he called that paper provocatively as where science and spirituality kiss each other so the idea was that there were people who were sick and the two people who had cancer and it was a curable cancer but a serious cancer and one of them was alone you know, they didn't have any loving many many relatives with them and the other person had i'm just giving a broad outlook of broad framework the experiment was much more detailed but the other was where there was this a couple they had been married together for 40 years and the woman was sick so the husband was told that you transmit messages of love and well being in your mind to her just offer your good wishes is it as if 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 she were sitting next to you and you would speak encouraging words to her to so speak like that and then they found they did this experiment similar experiment in several locations and they found that the cure happened much faster just because of this all other parameters were considered and uh, and uh, equated more or less but in general it is found that a loving atmosphere a sentiment of love when people feel cared and loved and valued then they recover faster so now what does this mean that this doesn't directly prove the spiritual reality all that it proves is that there is something beyond what we consider as the physical phenomena of health the physical understanding is the body is a machine and if certain parts get structurally damaged or, or physiologically imbalanced then the body becomes sick but the medication can remain the same and something more can make a difference big difference this field of health has now become a big big field i spoke in sales force again in uh, san jose san jose so there they have uh, mindfulness rooms mind on almost each building and they have mindfulness they have zen buddhist monks who come and they do retreats free at the company's cost for the uh, for the employees and they have found that by this the the stress level of the employees goes down so again all this means that there is something beyond the the tunnel vision of life that we have okay i get this this will improve my i take this pill this will improve my health i do this this will improve my health so now another very interesting paranormal phenomena is what is is found through something called the staring experiment a staring experiment means let's say i am sitting here right now and somebody sits behind me i just i can't see them at all and then that person is told stare at this person and sometimes they will stare sometimes they will not stare and i have to guess is this is the person staring at me or not staring at me so now normally if it were a complete random probability it would be 50% i could get it right i could get it wrong but almost universally everybody gets it right about 60% some people get it right 90% also and most of us have had this experience you now we feel somebody is looking at us and we turn around and that person just then looks away <laughs> something like that <laughs> so we all have that intuitive sense if somebody is staring at us now where does this come from so 
this indicates that if we consider this physical reality there is physical reality in which there are cause effect phenomena but from the physical reality perspective there is no way i can come to know somebody who is far away from me if somebody is physically close i can sense their breath or i can feel their proximity but if they are a significant distance away they are looking at me how do i come to know oh there is no there are there is much more to the universe than what we observe <clears throat> many paranormal phenomena have been uh, investigated by various scientists in fact alfred wallace was the co-founder of the theory of evolution and he wrote a whole book on para the paranormal and he starts his book with by saying that we don't ask our readers for faith we ask our readers for doubt he said we don't ask that you you have faith that the paranormal exists he asked that you have doubt about the about the rightness of your pre-existing beliefs be open to some higher reality so there is a huge amount of evidence and william james the prominent psychologist almost 100 years ago he said at that time itself and since then the evidence has uh, ballooned much much more uh, he said that to dismiss all such phenomena as just bad data that is poor scientific method generally in science also like everywhere else in life biases come in and robert frost was a social critic he said that the theories we like we call them facts and the facts we don't like we call them theories <laughs> so paranormal phenomena are quite well documented even carl sagan who was a skeptic he said that this paranormal phenomena is something which needs to be investigated because the sheer amount of evidence for it was so much that he said we need to find out more about it so this is paranormal phenomena now all that, this is, what are we talking about here that there is something beyond the world that we experience in a daily life there is some higher reality beyond now i am we talking about the what is the acronym we are discussing spirit, spirit yeah so Uh, P was paranormal phenomena. S was spiritual, spiritual longing. Spiritual longing itself, yeah. Now, the uh, when we talk about I, here we'll focus primarily on. I will come twice here. So I is the immort is the is the immortal longing for love. The slight difference between this. The first is that uh, im- I'll just call it immortal love. First is we long to live forever, but we don't just want to live forever. We long to love forever. Mm-hmm. We long to love forever means that most of the movies, most of the uh, novels, they are about romance, and they all end with you. Most of them end with again with H E A, happily ever after. <laughs> Now, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita. what it says is dukhale mashashwata it's exact opposite <laughs> happily ever after dukhale mashashwata <laughs> so now the bhagavad gita is not being pessimistic it's simply being realistic that this is the nature of the world and yet why do we have this longing to love forever so one is the nature of our own existence and the other is the nature of the exist in an inference towards the existence of the other who is also eternal and this so we are moving up and down in the hierarchy now first is i uh, through s i talk about there is something higher up there which we don't so, some realm where there is eternality then the second i talked about there is something beyond the physical world what is the nature of the physical world what is the nature of the non physical reality we may not know but there is something beyond the physical then beyond that if we consider i this indicates that there is the immortal love that we long for indicate that spiritual realm is not necessarily a depersonalized homogeneity that there is just existence so some people argue or they believe that in the spiritual level there is only consciousness existing so right now 
so you are looking at me i am looking at you so uh, when this is happening there are three elements so if i am speaking and i am looking at you then you are the object of my consciousness i am being conscious of you and i am the subject subject means i am observing the person who is observing and in between is the stream of consciousness so there is the object of consciousness the object of consciousness subject of consciousness and the stream of consciousness that's how perception takes place now some people hold that the spirit in the spiritual reality there is no subject and no object there is only the stream of consciousness so in hindi they say that aisa dhyan karo ki kaun dhyan kar raha hai kiska dhyan kar raha hai kaise dhyan kar raha hai iska bhi dhyan na rahe <laughs> now it sounds nice yes it's good as a mood for getting so absorbed that we forget everything but the, to get absorbed like that there has to be someone who will get absorbed and when you are absorbed absorption is a state of consciousness it is not a state of reality there's a difference isn't it i may forget everything around me but everything around me still exists so the the, the through this pointing out that immortal love which we all long for indicates that, this, that if there is a eternal level of reality there are other people in that reality now what the nature of those other people are what the nature of that other world is that is something which at this stage we can't know hmm? but we can infer that there is a likelihood of there being personality persons in that eternal realm where we can reciprocate then r is revelation and realization revelation of scripture and realization of the saints if we see the world traditions across history across geography have talked about some higher world whether it is christianity whether it is islam even buddhism which does not necessarily accept the idea of a god but they also talk about some higher reality in certain aspects these philosophies are very different but in certain aspects they are very similar if we consider christianity and buddhism this christianity islam all the abrahamic religions so christianity accepts soul but not reincarnation buddhism accepts reincarnation but not a soul <laughs> so their idea is christianity says yeah we are a soul but the soul is not going to come back it's only one chance and buddhism says that actually there is no self then then who is it that is going to reincarnate well that's a question that uh, their philosophers have been thinking for 2500 years now uh, not they say that it just there is just an illusion that there is a self but the why i'm not going to get into technicalities of different religions and their differences but the point i'm making is although there are differences you significant differences in other ideas there is in general understanding that there is some higher level of reality and that is where we belong so in fact a defining difference a define a difference between say the pre modern world views and the modern world view is that in the modern world view people started rejecting the idea of some other world before the advent of modernity we started with the age of science on the late 70 from the 17th century onwards but it will pick up momentum in the 19th century especially so before that all over people understood that this world is a transitional place jesus said that this world is like a bridge cross over it don't build your house on it hmm? so similarly uh, in the vedic tradition also it's understood that this world is temporary we belong to some other world so across traditions there have been description of some higher world and this revelation has also been uh, reinforced by the realization of great saints 
in the vedic tradition there is a concept called jivan muktaha there is there are two kinds of mukti there are two kinds of liberation there is videha mukti that is happens at death when the soul has no attachment to the body then that soul leaves the body and goes to the spiritual world but there will be some souls who are so advanced that they have no inter that they have no bodily attachments right now so although they are in the body but they are no longer attached to the body so those souls who are completely devoted to spiritual reality the spiritual pursuits they are considered as jivan mukta ihayasya hrayer dasya karmana manasa gira niklasu apya avasthasu jivan mukta sa uchchate right when all their faculties are used simply for the service of the lord then at that time even although they are in the body they are no longer attached to the body they are already liberated and it's only a matter of time when the body will run its due course and then they will attain eternal life so there have been saints who have talked about other world and they have had visions of that world and they have revealed those they have shared those visions with others also so if we consider shri prabhupad himself prabhupad did not focus so much on his paranormal visions hmm. but shri prabhupad when he would you know, they were devotees with prabhupad and at one time the devotee there is a beautiful picture of krishna eating lunch with his friends and as prabhupada was gazing at it and prabhupada was gazing at such such devotion such love such absorption and the devotees came and talk with him the devotees came to talk with him and he saw the prabhupada was absorbed he looked they were looking at the picture and prabhupada was gazing lost for some time then he came back to external consciousness he says would you like to go there so i think it was yamuna mata ji who tells this she says that you know the way prabhupada spoke it as if is like sometimes we may see a uh, see a picture of kashmir or we may picture of alaska or we may see a picture of some other hill station beautiful place would you like to go there <laughs> so it is just like that so for prabhupad it was as objective a reality as the physical world that we consider to be real <clears throat> so there have been saints who have had such extraordinary experiences where they just get transported to another level of reality many of the bhakti saints in their own revelations there is the famous story of uh, a saint in that tradition raghunath das goswami now he he was very austere oh, he he would hardly he would just take a little buttermilk once in 2 3 days is extremely renounced and uh, one day he was feeling a little sick so they called a vaidya so his followers called a vaidya and the vaidya diagnosed and he said you know swami ji has eaten too much sweet rice really that his disciples got offended he says what to speak of sweet rice he doesn't even take rice <laughs> he just takes a little curd that's all he eats it's a see the, the law there is a law of karma but uh, there are the law of karma works in, in exceptional ways say like uh, some people normally when we eat if we eat too much we gain weight but it's not that simple hmm? some people may have some some disease if somebody has some thyroid issue or something like that they eat a little and still their body balloons out and there are some people who treat their tongue like a conveyor belt <laughs> <laughs> so they eat a lot but nothing seems to happen to them <laughs> they stay they stay slim and um, light so uh, the we normally think of this cause will lead to this effect but reality is always more complex so when we see an effect there's not necessary that this has to be the cause so the effect that they saw was uh, the way the way the way there was the doctor was he was being in for us. he said the stomach is upset and the cause, logical cause of this is somebody is eating too much sweet 
So then they said, he doesn't eat sweets, you are offending him. He said, no, no, but that is the cause. So then they felt a little apprehensive where they decided to go and ask Agunadas Goswami. And this is what the Vaidya is saying. He said, that's true. This is what? He said that yesterday night in the spiritual world, there was a big festival. And there, Radharani had herself cooked sweet rice for Krishna. And after Krishna ate sweet rice, all, everybody else took sweet rice. So, Raghunath Goswami in the spiritual world is an associate of Radharani. He is a manjuri over there. He says the, the remnants were so delicious that we also took it. And I, because of that sweet rice I took, I, my stomach has got upset. So now, I say that mm, this is not a convenient explanation for us to use. <laughs> but actually speaking, he was experiencing reality at a different level. Mm. There is a physical reality and there is a spiritual reality. So sometimes what happens at the spiritual level can get transmitted to the physical. The effects may come at the physical level. So that there is <clears throat> Dr. Jan Stevenson, is, he's a prominent researcher in uh, in past life memories and he's written a paper called paranormal modification of biological form where he talks about how uh, the physical body can be affected by uh, by impressions so he found that if a mother who is pregnant if, uh, she sees some very fearful stimuli say if there are documented cases that a mother who was pregnant she used to watch a lot of horror movies and uh, so then especially movies involving a lot of fire so this child whenever after he was born whenever you see fire he will start crying whenever he sees fire he would start crying so there are there are traumas that get transmitted like that so similarly there is the physical reality but from a higher level of reality things can happen over here so this is real revelation of scripture and realization of the seeds then I is the, again this is slightly different, but again the innate longing for a better life. Innate longing for a better life means, earlier I talked about how we long to live forever, we long to love forever. But beyond that, a scient a mainstream scientists or may, people who are atheistic may say, we don't believe in all this revelation, realization. That is all just people's delusion. Okay, that might be so. But then, as I said, before the pre-modern times, everybody almost believed that there is a higher world which you are to attain. So now with the, tech, so with the advent of science and especially of technology, what has happened is that that same longing has now been transmitted into the world of technology. That means people have rejected the idea of a religious paradise, but now everybody is dreaming of a technological paradise. Oh, through technology we'll control all our environment. If it's too hot, we'll make it cold. If it's too cold, we'll make it hot. Now, if we can, to whatever extent, we can change it. But the idea that we can create a paradise over here, that is not going to work. Mm. I believe in Cal the California fire that is tragically going on. There's a, there's a town called Paradise. And it was raised to the ground, completely eliminated, practically. So, we cannot create paradise in this world. In fact, there is a field of science, scientific research, which they call it as transhumanism. Transhumanism is the idea that we want, we want humanity to transcend its human limitations. And they say, human life is beset with problems. And the most crippling problems are old age, disease, death and birth. Now, of course, for them, birth is not rebirth. For them, birth is population explosion. But the point is, they're talking about it the same way. Old age is there, disease is there, death is there and somehow, we want to stop it. So much technological advancement is geared towards this. 
So we have not given up the idea of a religious paradise. We are still longing for it. So we have an innate longing for a better life, which we have, some, we have not abandoned that as unscientific. We just redirected in some other way. I was once giving a class on Narsin Chaturdashi and one boy, he asked a question of that, you know, you know, we live in the age of science. How can you believe in something as mythological as a half man, half lion? You know, so I said, then why do you believe in something as mythological as a half man and a half bat? <laughs> <laughs> or a half man and a half spider? Is it? He says, no, no, we don't believe in it. Then why do you watch it? Oh, we watch it only for entertainment. No, but while you are trying to seek entertainment, what are you doing? You are suspending your disbelief. Now, why would you do that? He says, no, that's just for enjoyment. But why would you consciously seek something which you know is unreal for your enjoyment? That indicates that reality as it exists is not satisfying for you. And that's why you want to go to some other reality. And that reality is, at one level you could say, fictional or virtual. See, most entertainment today is escapist entertainment. People want to escape, not just from their lives. People want to escape from themselves. I just don't want to be me. I want to become someone else. So, if you consider this is the physical reality, this is the spiritual reality. So we have rejected the spiritual reality, saying this is what we call it mythological. But then that innate longing for a to be for have a better life, a better <coughs> world, to be a better person, we have simply transposed it to not upwards to the spiritual level, but downwards to a fictional level, to a virtual level. And that's where we long to enjoy life so the longing itself is eternal it's 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 universal but we have simply redirected it and it's not just redirected it's unfortunately misdirected right now because that brings us last part of this that t is the transformational potency of spirituality spirituality we say oh different people different believe in different worldviews or oh, you believe in your spiritual worldview. I believe in materialism. Yes, different people can have different worldviews. But what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that what is offering you is not just a different worldview. It is offering a different world to view. That means it offers us a process by practicing which our consciousness can become elevated. And once that consciousness becomes elevated, we will actually perceive spiritual reality this is physical this is spiritual and this is not just a matter of abstract conception that this is there in spiritual this is there in spiritual the Bhagavad Gita tells us there is a process you can follow by which you can raise your consciousness upwards and the fictional no matter how many books or how many books or movies or Batman or Spider-Man somebody watches they are not going to actually see Batman or Spider-Man <laughs> it? there is no uh, Batman loka <laughs> or Spider-Man Loka, isn't it? Where people will go. And so this is, it's fictional and it's always going to be fictional. But there are great saints who have told that they've experienced a higher reality. And after experiencing that reality, they have come to share that experience with us. So transformational potency means that we can ourselves become transformed. I was in Canada. I was talking, uh, I was giving a class about the existence of God. So, one, one person asked a question, have you seen God? So I said that, whatever I answer, it will just be a matter of faith for you. Now if, if I say yes, you will say, what is the proof? If I say no, it will say, that you, what are you talking about? I said that, but Prabhupada asked this question, Prabhupada gave answers in different ways. One way he answered was that, how does that matter to you? He said, I am giving you a process by which you can see God yourself. 
and to the extent we follow the process we start moving forwards up so we don't have to necessarily believe somebody's claims this claim this the visions can be a pointer for our faith but the most important aspect of spirituality is that we ourselves by our spiritual practices can realize that we don't have to be so dependent on the body and on material things we can start experiencing peace strength and joy coming from some higher level of reality what uh, what do i mean by a higher level of reality so just as a, if there's a small child when a child baby is newborn the baby doesn't even know what is all around it even when the mother is holding the baby the baby doesn't even understand there is a mother and when when the mother is breastfeeding the baby all the baby understands is oh there is some soft substance from me something soft is coming does it understand anything at all but as the baby starts growing then she starts understanding oh this is this is the person who loves me very much gradually then she will start associating the name oh this is my mom this is my mother so now suppose that baby is grown up to understand that there's a mother and mother loves me and she's sleeping at night and suddenly it becomes cold and she starts shivering she starts shivering at that time the mother sees it oh and mother my baby is trembling and the mother puts a comforter on the baby when the mother puts the comforter the baby's eyes are still closed the baby has not seen her mother but just by the transformation Oh, I was feeling cold. Now I'm feeling cozy. Just by the transformation, she infers, "Oh, my mother must be here, and my mother must have put the comforter on me." So similarly for us, right now our eyes are closed. We are spiritually asleep. So we can't directly perceive spiritual reality. But even while we are spiritually asleep, we can perceive the transformation that comes because of spiritual reality. the baby is in the sleep state but in the waking state in physical reality the baby is in the mental world could say sleep dream state in the physical level a change has happened comforter has been put on her body and she feels it similarly for us we are caught in the physical level of reality physical mental but beyond that is the spiritual level and when we when we practice bhakti when we chant the holy names when we worship the deities when we immerse us in krishna leela we experience a certain relief we experience a certain comfort we experience a certain strength we experience a certain joy and that experience is a pointer that there is a higher reality there is a higher experience krishna the higher reality is what i am experiencing right now and as we as the baby awakens the baby will see her mother also similarly when we practice bhakti bhakti paresha anubhava bhakti is a process which gives par isha anubhav experience of the transcendental lord and that experience leads to viraktir anyatra cha we don't become so dependent on other things for our strength for our security for our peace yes in the world things will go up and down but by our inner strength we will stay focused we will stay purposeful will stay peaceful this transformation is the ultimate test of spiritual reality pratyakshavagamam dharmam susukham kartum avyam krishna says 9.2 in the bhagavad gita pratyakshavagamam you will experience it yourself just a few days ago we celebrated shri prabhupad's disappearance day the prabhupad's disappearance there is a uh, there is a video of that the final the final lesson it describes prabhupad's physical prabhupad's condition in the last few uh months of his life and prabhupad was completely emaciated he was so emaciated in fact that he was just bones one of his scientist disciples dr t d singh bhakti sarod dawnar swami he became later he came to meet him and he was shocked to see prabhupad's condition and when he saw prabhupad prabhupad saw that he was shocked and prabhupad was so transcendental although his body was in such a terrible condition prabhupad was so transcendental prabhupad said you are a scientist you want proof isn't it 
As all my life, I have been telling you, you're not the body, you're the soul. See, but now I'm demonstrating it to you. My body has gone, but I'm still here. So Prabhupada's, uh, Prabhupada's spiritual strength, Prabhupada's spiritual purpose was there. You see that video, there is a, towards the last time of his life, he's, he's, he has so little strength that he can barely move his lips and produce some sound. The devotees are you keeping a dictaphone right near his mouth. And he's dictating the purports to the Srimad Bhagavatam, even in that condition. And on the last purports, he says, no, Krishna is the supreme controller. Everything happens by his will. And then he says that the modes of passion and ignorance in this world are very dangerous. If we stay in the association of devotees, then we can stay in goodness and move towards transcendence. And thus we can attain Krishna. So Prabhupada himself demonstrated life at a higher level of consciousness. Despite the trauma of death, he was completely, he was, he was transcendental to it. And thus, he also demonstrated transcendence. And we all, if we practice bhakti, we will experience some level of higher reality. Something which gives us strength, by which say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we are not practicing bhakti, if a problem came in our life, we might have been overwhelmed by it. But now if a problem comes, we are still concerned, but we don't get that overwhelmed. From somewhere within, strength has come. That strength has come by our experience of higher spiritual reality. So this transformation potency of spirituality is the greatest, uh, is the greatest conviction, uh, conviction provider for all of us. Hmm. About uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, I was in Mumbai in the Juhu temple. I was in the morning program, I was walking and chanting and somebody had spilled some water over there. So I didn't notice it and I just walked on it. I slipped and fell. So at that time, I used to wear a brace. So the brace means the leg doesn't get folded. So when I fell, the leg just went completely off like that. And I had osteoporosis from my from many years because I have polio. So it was a small fall, but the it was almost like the the thigh bone, the femur almost came out. Three fourth of it was severed. It was horribly painful. And at that time, I, 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 I somehow have some connection with the Bhagavad Gita. I love to recite the Bhagavad Gita verses and to memorize and recite and contemplate. So at that time, suddenly I just started chanting the Bhagavad Gita verses. Then I started chanting, reciting second chapter, third chapter verses. It's almost as if the pain just went away. As soon as I stopped reciting, I the pain came back. So you know, normally on Gita Jayanti or something, we recite the full Bhagavad Gita. So that three, four hours from that time, in, initially we thought the pain is the circumstance because a small fall. Then we did an x-ray and then they found that the, it, was, it was a terrible fracture. He said you have to go to the hospital immediately. You'll have to do a surgery. So those four, five hours in which we traveled from Juhu Temple to Bhaktivedanta Hospital and another part of Mumbai, all that time I was reciting the Bhagavad Gita. That was probably the most intense recitation of the Gita that I had done. <laughs> and it struck me that actually it is almost like my body is here, I am here. And this, it's if I can keep reciting the Bhagavad Gita, my consciousness comes where I am. I mean, the consciousness comes to the spiritual level. As soon as I stop reciting, the consciousness goes into the body. And as soon as the consciousness goes into the body, I feel pain. So, of course, I did not do that out of devotion. I did it simply I did it simply to avoid the pain. One day, I hope I'll do it in devotion in future. But for all of us, we can, when, when problems come in our life, if we can take shelter of Krishna, we can experience some relief, we can experience some strength. And that indicates that there is a higher reality. And that higher reality can give us strength and shelter even amidst the uh, negativities that we may experience in physical reality. So in that sense, the spiritual world is not just something which you will experience when after we die, we are pure enough to go to Krishna's abode. The, the potency of the spiritual reality, of the spiritual world, we can experience even now if we strive to become absorbed in Krishna. Mayeva Nivasishyasi mayeva ata urdhvam na samshayaha 12.8 Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 
if your mind and intelligence are fixed in me then you are already living in me mai eva mana dhatsva mind fixed in me mai buddhim nivesha your intelligence is engaged in me then nivasishasi mai eva you are already living in me you are already have attained spiritual reality so in that way for those who become absorbed in krishna the spiritual world is not mythology it's not a possible reality it actually becomes a fundamental reality and it is on the basis of spiritual reality that we that we have consciousness and through that we experience all other realities including the physical which is what we normally consider real but the spiritual so krishna is not just real he is realer than reality that means he is the foundation of what we call as reality and that conviction the devotee gets the devotee advances and experiences the transformational potency of spirituality so i'll summarize i spoke today about uh, is this spiritual world just a religious mythology i talked about an acronym what was that spirit, spirit. so s was spiritual, spiritual longing. longing we all long for and because everything around us is temporary this longing is as out of place as a remote native american child wanting to know about a baklava or uh we finding a gold in a place where there's no gold so it point that this belongs somewhere else that there is some other level of reality where this longing resides then p was paranormal phenomena i talked about two prominent phenomena one was the How, where science and spirituality kiss how you know a loving uh, relationships and love messages sent to a sick person uh, has been found to accelerate their healing and secondly staring experiment where people can guess better than what would be by a normal uh, guess work whether somebody is staring at them so these phenomena indicate that the physical reality is not all that there is there is something beyond it we have a conception this cause this effect but there can be some other cause and there can be some other effect also beyond what we see as cause effect connection then i was immortal longing for love yeah immortal love immortal longing for love thank you we all we all long not just to live forever but to love forever so that indicates that the spiritual world if it uh, if it's a reasonable inference Uh, i talked about how we can't prove conclusively anything even our own existence in terms of mathematical or scientific proof there is no scientific proof that we exist scientific proof exists because we exist so we can draw an inference that that spiritual level is not just non differentiated consciousness there is a subject of consciousness there is a object of consciousness and there is a stream of consciousness no where there are different persons reciprocating love that's it. that's the most reasonable explanation for a longing for immortal love then r was revelation yeah thank you revelation and realization talked about how across the world uh, the traditions talk about some other world which is our ultimate destination and saints have had experiences of that ragunath das goswami a physical effect on his health was because of the food that he ate at a spiritual level then i was second i innate yeah our innate longing for a better world is slightly different first is our our own self existence should be eternal we should have a eternal object for love and we want a better world to live in hmm? so innate longing this i talked about how science has not rejected science has not eliminated our longing for Uh, for a better world for a eternal world it has simply redirected it and that's why we instead of seeking a religious paradise now are seeking a technological paradise mm. but of course through technology we cannot create a paradise because the world has its own nature and last was t transformation transformation transformational potency of spirituality so there i talked that bhagavad gita doesn't offer just as a, another world view but it offers another world to view that means people they may reject, they may say that okay you believe in a half man half law and i believe in a half man half bat what's the big difference so even atheists believe skeptics believe in something like this indicate that there's a longing but the difference is 
no matter how much somebody becomes absorbed in uh, batman or spider man they are not like, there's no batman loka where they will go and see anything but absorption krishna can give us experience of krishna and that experience is that we experience peace strength and joy by our connection with krishna just as a baby with closed eyes can infer the mother's presence and love by the warmth that she feels when a comforter is put on her similarly when we put the comforter of krishna consciousness on our consciousness we try to become conscious of krishna then we will experience relief strength and these point to the spiritual reality and i talked about prabhupad's transcendence amidst uh, his great physical incapacitation towards the end of his life and how we all can also experience amidst physical pain and distress strength from a higher level of reality and that experience of some non physical strength is the greatest conviction that there is a non physical spiritual reality thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments yes please prabhu you were talking about uh, revelations and realizations of saints yeah so the realizations of saints for the others it becomes almost as good as revelations only okay right so it, it basically at a one point of time it feels like it's a revelation for personally for me because i have not experienced it directly. okay that's true so given that situation it, it it could only act as a pointer for me that's true and it's my faith to pursue that that's true path and pointer so as you are saying like it looks more like it's the direct experience that is going to convince me to walk the path on a consistent basis can okay. you elaborate on that okay good question so when you talk about revelation of saint uh, realization of saints we have no so it's just a like a revelation that we have to accept on faith so uh, what will spur us on it is our, is it our own experience okay by experience we can have two distinct meanings for this uh, as far as moving forward in our spiritual life is concerned in our spiritual journey what is it that will take us forward if we are i gave a whole class on uh, in i gave a class on how to emigrate to the spiritual world <laughs> now immigration is a big issue right now <laughs> so how to immigrate from here to the spiritual world so basically if you want to go to the if you want somebody wants to come from india to america what is the required first of all there is a desire then second is the qualification and third is the process and then in the process there is some difficulty there is an attitude you have to have confidence you have to have faith you have to be optimistic can move on like that so for us in our spiritual journey also how do we get that desire desire is what we primarily need uh, now desire can come through others experiences through our experiences but more sustainably it comes through our conviction jeev goswami explains in the shat sandarbhas that for those who are completely spiritually realized those who are siddhas or spiritually perfected they stay in bhakti because of their preeti they love krishna and that's why they are naturally practicing bhakti but for sadhakas he says what will keep them in their bhak keep them in bhakti is not preeti but buddhi intelligence because sometimes we feel a lot of devotion for krishna sometimes we may do our japa and we may feel such peace such strength we feel that japa should never end on most days however we feel japa never ends <laughs> <laughs> it's going on and on and on <laughs> so for us the feelings will keep going up and down so in that sense if we consider experiences in terms of what am i experiencing right now well those experiences are very fickle if we count on those experiences we will not be able to commit ourselves to anything in life or to speak of spiritual life even in our relationships uh, is it that even when we love someone 
Is it that we love everything that they do? We love every moment with them? Not necessarily. A mother naturally feels love for her newborn child, for a baby. But if after a long day's work, the mother is sleeping and suddenly at night the baby starts crying. Well, love is not the first emotion the mother may feel at that time, is it? <laughs> mother will wake up and care for the child. But that's because, not because of just, it's not just because of some loving sentiment, it is because of a loving commitment. So similarly, for us, uh, we need to have philosophical conviction to move forward steadily in our spiritual life. And then, where does our philosophical conviction come from? It will come usually from hearing the philosophy. Hearing the philosophy, hearing the pastimes. In general, there are two aspects. There is conviction and there is attraction. So we could say, the conviction comes from the philosophy. The attraction comes from the pastimes. But we need both. If we do not have the philosophy, then the attraction that comes Today I am attracted to Krishna. There are some people who see, who hear Bhagavad Katha or Rama and Mahabharata Katha as pious entertainment. Mm -hmm. So they will they will be watching say uh, on YouTube or on TV some Bhagavad Katha and they hear about the about the Gopi separation from Krishna. They hear, read about how Jatayu sacrificed. They watch Jatayu sacrificing his life and they start crying tears. And then the program ends. They change the channel and a cricket match is going on <laughs> and say Virat Kohli gets out early and they start crying there also. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so then that means that, that spirit, their emotions are not that spiritual. Yes, uh, uh, spiritual emotions means that Bhakti Paresha Anubhava Virakti Ranyatracha, we should be detached from other emotions. So conviction is what is required and that's why we need to study philosophy regularly. Siddhanta Baliya Chitte Nakare Alas Ihahaite Krishna Lage Sudrudha Manas. They said that Siddhanta Baliya. Don't call it. This is a simply philosophy. I am not interested in it. Chitte Nakare Alas. Don't be lazy about it. Ihahaite. By this, what will happen? Krishna Lage Sudrudha Manas. Your mind will be fixed on Krishna. So it is by philosophical conviction that we will get the impetus to move forwards in our spiritual life. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, yes, sir. Question. Yeah. In the spirit acronym as the P, the paranormal activities and mm. the phenomena, uh, where does the concept of subconscious mind fit in there? Because okay. mm. in my personal life example, uh, there have been times when I have been uh, very particular about say waking up early in the morning and I've set up my mind to get up at 3 a.m. And without an alarm clock, I have gotten up at exactly, and I looked at the clock, it is exactly at 3 a.m. Hmm. Is that something paranormal or is it a subconscious mind? What is it that, how would you call that activity? Okay, yeah, okay. So if we s determine to do something, say I want to wake up at 3 a.m. And even without an alarm, I, we wake up exactly at the same time. So how does that work? Yeah. See, sleep is a great mystery actually. <laughs> <laughs> we sleep every day but biology it is still not been able to explain why we need to sleep we need to rest that's required for the bodily rejuvenation but why does our consciousness need to switch off if you see when we sleep uh, the, the only time we think about sleeping or uh, we think about not sleeping about sleep we think about sleep the only only time we do it is when we are unable to sleep. Otherwise, we feel sleepy, we sleep. We have to wake up, we wake up. But if you think about it, sleep, it's not just being tired, it's not just lying down in a comfortable place. But there is a moment beyond our control when the consciousness switches off. And that switch off of the consciousness is when we are able to sleep. Sometimes we may lie down, especially if we have if you travel from India to America or America to India, there's jet lag. And then what happens in jet, when there's jet lag? We can't sleep at the right time and we end up sleeping at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it may be night and everybody is sleeping, but we just, we just can't sleep. So the, the 
<coughs> the transition there are four states of consciousness what we are right now in is jagruti the awakened consciousness what we are all hopefully in <laughs> some of us might be in sapna also right now <laughs> so sapna is the sleep state then beyond that is the deep dreamless sleep that is called sushupti and then beyond that is turya or samadhi where there is spiritual awareness so normally we go from jagruti to sapna and sapna to jagruti and this transition is something which is not in our control it just happens so of course as i said we can't necessarily sleep just by will, willing to sleep hmm? and we can't necessarily wake up just by willing to wake up now this doesn't mean our will doesn't matter our will also matters but our will is not the sole decider so uh, when we are able to make a resolution when we resolve to wake up at a particular time and we do wake up hmm? what happens is that it is explained that in everything that we do there are three factors involved there is the jiva there is the ishwar and there is the prakriti so the soul the supreme lord and the material nature so uh, in each action all these three factors are involved so the jiva desires the super soul sanctions and the material nature prakriti executes so right now when i am speaking it is it's just an effortless act but it's not effortless uh, why it's not effortless in the sense that i don't even know how it happens i get a thought and i want to express my thought now i don't know how my voice box works how the voice cords move specifically to produce particular sound which make me mean particular things so i desire to do something when i desire to do that it is krishna who sees that desire and krishna sanctions and then the body acts accordingly and that's it. that's how the material nature executes so sometimes if our desire is strong to do something then when the super soul sanctions it even when we are asleep the super soul does not sleep chakshur yasana rishyati and the super soul Uh, actually signals it to material nature okay this person wants to wake up at this time let him wake up at this time but sometimes what happens is we have two sets of desires so for example even when what to speak of waking up as per our intention even with the alarm clock which you set and the alarm clock rings and the alarm clock is in get up and something inside is and go to sleep <laughs> so what happens is <laughs> that voice inside go to sleep we usually hear that voice and then we go to sleep again so basically what we need to do is that <coughs> we can't rely only on external aids but we can't rely only on internal resolution because we will see that sometimes we decide to wake up at a particular time and we are able to wake up but sometimes we decide and not we will do wake up also so why is that because our desire our intention is only one factor in the equation hmm? and there are other factors which are not in our control so uh, so it is, now the subconscious is used in two different senses going back to that question about a subconscious mind hmm. there is uh, basically in our mind mind is the place where impressions are stored and in those impressions we could say right now we are conscious of some things so right now you are looking at me i am looking at you you are hearing me i am speaking something but beyond what we are conscious of there is a lot of other things in our mind also which we can be conscious of which we choose to so you are sitting next to someone now you have not met that person for a long time but you know that person then if you focus on them you will remember their name you will remember about their family you remember about their background and you can talk But that's not in the forefront of your consciousness. So, if you consider a computer metaphor, the conscious mind is like what is the information on the computer screen. The subconscious mind is what is the information in the computer's hard disk. You can recall it when you want. But beyond that, there is a unconscious mind also. This unconscious mind is like information that is there in the computer. You don't even know it is there. 
<laughs> so there are some inf some some inf some impressions we are not even aware of and it requires a lot of effort to become aware of those things so from a psychological perspective this is conscious mind subconscious and unconscious so this conscious mind is like the tip of the iceberg and is a lot more below however the subconscious mind there are books written on the power of the subconscious mind or things like that so there basically uh, in psychology or in self help literature there is a tendency to make the mind into god that means if you desire something and if you just desire it strongly enough it will happen now yes our desire our intentions do matter and it's always good to have a positive attitude but it's not that our desire is going to make anything and everything happen isn't it if somebody has got a terminal disease and they're about to die and they say i'm not going to die i'm not going to die i'm not going to die and then they will they will leave their body and they will go to yamaraj and say you are dead <laughs> so just thinking that i'm not going to die is not going to stop the biological death so there is a physical reality and the in the power of the subconscious mind when they say that you just you just take your intentions and let them percolate into your subconscious and then whatever you desire you will be able to achieve well, that is a uh, exaggerated claim it's an overstatement certainly the intentions that are more deeply internalized uh, we will draw energies more than our conscious energy for fulfilling them but it is not that they are omnipotent we have more potency than what we think we have but that doesn't more potency doesn't mean infinite potency does that answer your question yes thank you any last question Yes, Prabhu. Please. So, Prabhu, uh, when we make this, um, you said that we should use our buddhi to be on the spiritual path. Right. And we definitely uh, make an effort, but there are so many things which are distracting us, pulling us, making it difficult to follow the spiritual path. Sometimes we don't even understand uh, the things properly. So, how do we? But you miss so many things. Means. Like you know, you know, living in the world, dealing with people, dealing with job. and dealing with the opinions of different people there are many things to distract us from the spiritual path and sometimes our just our own weakness makes it hard to you know uh, work on our what we believe is the right thing and we come across this on regular basis so how do we actually keep moving forward just working through all these obstacles which are coming our way is that question mm -hmm. okay so when we when we face many distractions in our life how can we move forward amidst those distractions yeah it's a challenging situation determination is uh, we both our intelligence which leads to conviction and the determination thereof they are not like a fixed deposit so i put invest that much and it's always there it's more like a like a deposit in a stock market share so depending on the how the stock market is going the value may be very high the value may be very low also like that our conviction and determination keep varying so we need to replenish it regularly now replenishing meet that we have to observe within the broad activities of sadhana bhakti within the broad activities of bhakti what activity energizes me the most we have standard activities of sadhana bhakti that we do but along with that the activity that energizes us the most we need to take special time out to do that so if we like to do puja of the deities then that's what we need to make time for that uh, rupa goswami calls this as uddeepan uddeepan means spiritual stimulus and it it can vary from individual to individual just like we can consider sensual stimulus material stimulus now for all of us what might agitate our minds materially can vary we got we got food items not everybody is attracted to the same food items necessarily 
everybody is attracted to different different food items so, so just as there are different sensual stimuli that may uh, attract us similarly there are different spiritual stimuli that may attract each one of us so we have to find out what spiritual stimuli uh, can uh, connect us with krishna most effectively and we keep that readily readily accessible to us so it might be if we like to hear classes of a particular devotee then keep uh, some in their classes or some extracts from their classes some specially inspiring classes keep them readily accessible if we like to hear kirtan then keep kirtan readily accessible so when we keep these things readily accessible then whenever the mind when we start feeling weak then we can draw on the sources of strength so it's uh, we needn't see uh, our spiritual weakness as a character flaw our spiritual weakness is simply a circumstantial inevit- inevitability we will be strong for some time and after that we will become weak so rather than thinking oh something must be wrong why am i feeling like this yeah something is wrong but it's not that there's something uh, uh, because it's not that there's something because of which i cannot practice spiritual life i cannot be serious about spiritual life okay i can practice it at whatever i i, I just need to get the strength back again and then i'll be able to practice it so that's one aspect to it that wherever we get the strength for we, we make time to do that activity the second is that we don't have to necessarily uh, reduce spiritual life to just a certain set of activities that means if i'm not able to do this this that means i'm not spiritual a spiritual life is more a set of more a consci- matter of consciousness than of activities so i write articles on the bhagavad gita every day at gitadili.com mm, so there i try to put the gita's message in uh, Uh, memorable terms so i one article i wrote recently was that even if we can't succeed in krishna consciousness we can fail in krishna consciousness not fail out of krishna consciousness <laughs> 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 now what does that mean that means that failing in krishna consciousness means that even if i am not able to do a particular thing say if i decide to wake up in the morning but i am not able to wake up in the morning mm-hmm. now one reaction could be that hey, i can't wake up in the morning therefore the spiritual life business is not for me let me give it up only so i won't be able to chant i won't be able to do the sadhana just let me give it up that is failing out of krishna consciousness but it is not that if you can't chant in the morning that doesn't mean we are banned from chanting namna makari bodhi nija sarva shakti tatra arpita niyamita smarane na kala there are no rules for chanting. so that would mean that we can chant uh, that okay if i can't fail if i can't succeed in krishna consciousness i can fail in krishna consciousness that means okay krishna i am my conditioning is so strong i am not able to do this my conditioning my conditions are such that that too many distractions right now too many other things are coming up so let me uh, i am not able to do this right now but please i want to serve you please guide me how i can serve you best in this situation so sometimes uh, certain things do require time and attention when shri prabhupad was uh, before he started his con when he was a grahastha he was in varanasi and uh, he was in allahabad he was he had his own pharmacy business and he he used to give medicine and there was a doctor who used to prescribe the medicine prabhupada was the dispenser so that doctor's interview is there uh, about it and he says that that prabhupada was abhay babu was abhay is it is clear that abhay babu was a very deeply religious person but he says at that time his main question was the main thought dominating was how can i earn more money now he had his uh, daughters to get married one of his sons was very sick and he had to be treated properly so prabhupada was burdened by those thoughts so if we see prabhupada uh, might not have seemed to be say going to the gaudiya math temples regularly some of his gaudiya math devotees the god brothers were saying you know why don't you just move into the temple prabhupada was not doing that but in his own way he was krishna conscious so we have to see that uh, the distractions may stop us or limit us from the external activities of krishna consciousness but they don't have to stop our krishna consciousness itself we can see that even in this krishna i long to be with you i want to do the service more i'm just not able to do it please guide me how i can do it that longing is there 
and we are moving towards Krishna. It's like a traffic. Uh, if we, if you are traveling to a driving to a particular station, the traffic is too much. We have to go slowly. But if we are really eager to go to that place, then we are looking. How can I move forward? How can I move forward? Is there some other route? And then as soon as the route becomes clear, we will move faster. So similarly, there are situations in which the traffic in our life will become just too much. And then we can't do the external Krishna conscious activity that much. That's okay. That's a Krishna is an understanding God. He's not a judging God. Uh, but the test is that after the traffic clears, even after that also we are going slowly. <laughs> <laughs> that means we are not interested in going only. <laughs> so when the, when the conditions uh, become a little less inclement, when they become more favorable, then we can intensify our bhakti. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Gaur